Well, brothers and sisters, we gain a tremendous insight into our faith journey from St. Paul today in the second reading from his second letter to the Corinthians. He uses a phrase there that is often repeated in the Christian world and in our encouragement of one another as we live out our faith, and that is precisely that we walk by faith. We walk, in other words, we're on a journey, and we know the destination we're going to, the eternal life in Christ that is already in us and that will flower in its perfection in heaven. We are walking, we are moving. Uh, this is a journey. Our life is a journey. Our life in faith is a journey. And then he says we walk by faith, not by sight. Now what does that mean? Let's explore that a little bit. And he draws, of course, from that, a very fundamental conclusion. Because we walk by faith, not by sight, we are courageous. And in this very brief passage, he says it twice. The second reading begins, we are always courageous. And then a little bit later, after saying we walk by faith, not by sight, he says we are courageous yet again. We walk by faith, not by sight. Brothers and sisters, first of all, faith is not blind. We do believe in things that we could not know had God not revealed them and that we cannot figure out for ourselves. We think, for example, of the passage in John chapter 6, the Eucharistic discourse. Uh, Jesus said to them, I will give you my true flesh as food, my blood as real drink. And many broke away from him. We can't take this. They said this is utter nonsense. But the apostles who stayed, led by Peter, didn't necessarily understand what Jesus said any better than the ones who left. The difference was they trusted him. Peter said, Lord, we know, we have come to be convinced that you are God's Holy One. So to whom else can we go? Your words are true. That doesn't mean he understood the words. That means he trusted the one who spoke the words. So faith does get us to the point where we can assent to the truth that we could not figure out for ourselves. But there's always a motive of credibility. There is something that we do know. He said we know that you are God's Holy One. There is something we know that then gives us the confidence, gives us the motive to believe further what we don't know. And that's how faith works. So it's not that it's totally blind. Otherwise, anybody that came along and said, I have a message from God, how would you know whether to believe them or not? There has to always be an evaluation. Why are we believing this particular source rather than that one? So when he says we walk by faith, not by sight, what is he saying? We know that there are things we believe in which are invisible. Right now, in this room, there are countless angels worshiping God at the same time, in the same place, as we are worshiping God. We know that they're here, how? By faith. We do not know it by sight. In the Eucharist, in a few moments, the sacred host will be transformed into the body and blood of Christ. But it won't look any different after the transformation. We walk by faith, not by sight. So in one sense, the meaning of this verse is precisely, literally, there are things we cannot see with our physical eyes, but we know them by faith. But I want to explore a different level of meaning in this, in this assertion that we walk by faith and not by sight. And it is this, that when we say by sight, we mean by our human ability to evaluate the evidence in front of us. Not just seeing with the eyes but understanding what we're facing, a difficulty, a situation that we might be in, which by all human calculation might be impossible to deal with. And that is why when we say we walk by faith, Paul will say we are courageous. The courage comes from knowing something about the current situation that merely human evaluation would not know. Many, many examples come to mind. We have in the Old Testament the great liberation of God's people from Egypt. And there was that moment of courage when having come out of Egypt, why? Because Pharaoh chased them out because the plagues were coming upon him and his household and his people. They had been 
released from Egypt, but they had not yet crossed the sea, and then Pharaoh and his armies changed their minds and went after them in pursuit. And so they had Pharaoh and his armies on the one side and the Red Sea on the other. And that was a moment in which human calculation could not figure out what they should do next. And God said to Moses, tell the Israelites to go forward. We walk by faith, not by sight. God said something. Human calculation can't figure it out. But because he said it and we know in whom we trust, we will go forward. And he went forward with the opening of the sea. Of course, far earlier than that in salvation history, Abraham was told to go seek out another land. And he was told he would be, in his 90s, the father of descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky, and he didn't have any children yet. And then, of course, we come to other moments in salvation history like the Lamentations of Jeremiah, where the Babylonians had taken over the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and Jeremiah is lamenting by the edge of the city, that book of Lamentations, all the grief of the human heart pouring out, and then yet right in the middle of that, he says, the favors of the Lord are not exhausted. His mercies are not spent. They are renewed each morning. He didn't know at that point, none of the people knew, how the promises of God would be fulfilled, that from their people would arise the Messiah. They didn't know how this would come about. They didn't see how they could overcome the power of the enemy. But they too walked by faith. And we have an even greater faith. We who know Jesus Christ, we who know the fullness of the revelation of God. And so Paul says, we are courageous. We know the victory of grace over sin because it's in Christ that sin has been destroyed. We know the victory of life over death because Christ is risen. And the entire kingdom of death has been overturned. We are courageous then when we fight what essentially are echoes of a defeated kingdom, when we look at the culture of death, when we look at the power of sin, when we look at the confusion in our society about God's will and God's plan for marriage and for the family and for human life and for the unborn, we don't calculate just based on what we see or based on what surveys tell us or what votes, how votes tally up. We are courageous because we walk by faith, not by sight. And we know the victory of God over these evils. When we think about courage, in particular, I want to refer you to two other Old Testament stories, two of them from the books of the Maccabees and one from the book of Daniel. In the two books of the Maccabees, in particular in, in 2 Maccabees, uh, chapters uh, 6 and 7, we have portraits in courage. Uh, first from Eleazar. A Jewish martyr, this elderly man, was told under this persecution that was coming about through Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Antiochus was saying you must eat pork, and that of course was a violation of the, of the Jewish law. And this man said no, he will not eat the pork. And so his friends were trying to persuade him to save his life. And so he was permitted to eat meat that he could pretend was pork, and thus spare his life, and he didn't even want to do that. Because he said, well, if I know it's not pork, that's one thing. But if the others here, especially the young people, see me doing something that, as far as they know, is a violation of the law of God, it will scandalize them. I can't give them the bad example. I will not do it. And so he was killed for something that people might think was a small matter. What's the big deal? Why does the God of the universe care if the little piece of meat in your mouth is pork or not? But it was about fidelity to a way of life that he knew God had given his people and that he had been faithful to all his life. Fidelity to God gave him that courage. Walking by faith gave him that courage. In the following chapter there is the story of the mom with the seven sons. Likewise, being forced by the authorities to eat pork. Now, 
We walk by faith, not by sight. As far as sight was concerned, they were going to be killed by these, these ruthless, anti-God authorities. And they saw that they had the power, and they weren't giving them any choice in the matter. So by sight, they couldn't see any way out. But listen to what these children said as one by one they were put to death. They each gave a speech. See, that's another thing about faith. And Paul says it elsewhere. I believed, therefore I spoke. When we have faith, when we have the knowledge of God's truth that comes by faith, brothers and sisters, that finds its way from our mind and heart to our lips. I believed, therefore I spoke. These young men, before they were killed, spoke because the Word has to give the interpretation to our actions. And let me read a portion of one of the speeches by one of these brave young martyrs. He said, You are depriving us of this present life, but the King of the universe will raise us up to live again forever because we are dying for His laws. Walking by faith. And then another said, It was from heaven, as he stretched out his hands, he said, It was from heaven that I received these. For the sake of His laws, I disregard them. From Him, I hope to receive them again. Here's a very concrete article of faith that he was professing. The resurrection of the body. And we say it every time we say the creed. So because of the faith that he would receive his limbs back again, he could let an earthly tyrant cut them off rather than disobey the laws of God. And similarly in the book of Daniel, this is one of my favorite stories of the, uh, the three young men who were thrown into the fiery furnace. What happened here now, this was uh, in the 6th century before Christ, so earlier than what happened. What, the stories we just recounted about the Maccabees, that was like a, a century before Christ. But, but here now, 6 centuries before Christ, we had Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, set up a golden statue. And every time the music was played, people were ordered to bow down and worship the statue. Well, of course, believers in the true God cannot do that. The statue is an idol. You can't believe that the statue is God. You can't bow down and, 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 and adore the statue as if it's divine. And so this was brought to the king's attention. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed. Now, these three had positions in the kingdom. You have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, and their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. O king, they pay no attention to you. They will not worship the golden image that you set up. Well, of course they wouldn't. Contradicts the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods besides me. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was enraged. And so he asked them, is it true? Is it true that you're not going to obey my command and bow down before the statue that I made? And then he threatened them. I will cast you into a burning, fiery furnace. We walk by faith, not by sight. The sight told them. The human evaluation told them. This is the king. He has the power. He's giving us a specific command. He's not giving us any exemption. And there's a fiery furnace there. And there's some really big guys that are going to throw us into it. So human sight and evaluation says, this is a bad situation. And notice then what the king asks them in the next line. He says, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Well, of course, there is a God who would deliver them out of his hands. But they couldn't see him. What they could see is the king's hands. What they could see is the furnace. What they could see was the powerful men who would throw them into the furnace. But we walk by faith, not by sight. They knew by faith the God who could deliver them out of his hands because they believed in him, as do we, as a God of deliverance. And so the story goes on. And listen to these words of uncompromising fidelity and courage. 
that Paul calls us to in today's second reading, that these three young men said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, and this is interesting, they said, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Remember when Jesus likewise was silent before the earthly authorities prior to his crucifixion? He said nothing. We have no need to answer you, O king, in this matter. Why is that? Because we are accountable, we are responsible only to God in the end. Any responsibility we have to any human beings is because God has given them the authority. But if they abuse that authority by asking us to sin, we are not responsible to them. See, the word responsible means there's a response. And so by saying, we, we don't have to say anything to you about what we're going to do or not going to do, well, they're saying, well, we're not responsible to you. We're responsible to God. But then they go on to say, if this be so, our God whom we serve can deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, because after all, God is God, so they're saying, if God chooses not to deliver us, then, O king, know that we still will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He increased the heat of the furnace seven times. It was so hot that it killed the men who threw the, the three uh, young servants into the fiery furnace. And into the flames they went. And what happened? King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, rose up in haste, and declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Assuredly, O king, they answered. And he said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God. We walk by faith, not by sight. But sometimes God does allow us to see His workings. He allows us to see Himself in the Incarnation. And this, if you will, is like a little foreshadowing of the Incarnation, a little foreshadowing of the invisible God becoming visible. There is a fourth there walking with them and doing what? Liberating them, protecting them, freeing them. Brothers and sisters, they came out of the furnace and King Nebuchadnezzar then made a complete 180 degree turn and he said to the people, no one is to speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There is no God. Now this is the king speaking. There is no other God able to rescue in this way. And then he gave these three a promotion in the kingdom. Paul says... Therefore, we are courageous. We cannot keep calculating just what we see. We cannot just keep calculating in our walk of faith just what we can measure, what we can figure out, and the risks that we see we are taking as we are faithful to God. We need to be faithful even if the calculation doesn't work. For example, we at Priests for Life, along with many others right now, are fighting the Obama administration in regard to the HHS mandate. And just prior to giving this, uh, this homily, in these recent days, we have filed our case with the Supreme Court of the United States. And we are saying that we're not going to violate our faith by following the regulations that the government is imposing on us right now in terms of what gets covered in the health insurance plan that we offer to our employees. The bottom line, outside of all the complexities of the legislation, is that we cannot do what the king, quote unquote, is asking us to do. We can't. And they're saying, well, we're going to throw you into the fiery furnace. You're going to have fines. You're going to have legal consequences. And we're saying, so what? If what you're saying we have to do to avoid those legal consequences is offend the God we serve and break the moral law we believe in, well then we say the same thing that the three young men said. 
There is a God who can deliver us out of your hands. But if, even if he doesn't, know, O king, that we will not follow your decree. This is the same spirit that infuses the Old Testament, fills salvation history, and inspires the apostles to say, we will obey God rather than men when they are told not to teach in the name of Jesus. This is Christian history from the beginning unto today. There was also one more story I want to include here, Polycarp. Now this is in the first century going into the second century of Christianity. He uh, was arrested for being a Christian. And he was presented with a choice also. Say Caesar is Lord and put a small pinch of incense in front of Caesar's statue. And by doing this, you can escape death. And Polycarp's response, in that same spirit of faith, not sight, in that same spirit of we are always courageous, said this, 86 years I have served Christ. He never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And to this day we celebrate St. Polycarp as a martyr. Brothers and sisters, let's all apply this in our own circumstances, in our own walk of faith today, because we all know the ways in which we are challenged to live the faith, tempted to compromise the moral law. We all know the difficulties of bringing about that moral law in our society, especially in the fight against abortion, the fight to defend marriage, the fight to defend religious freedom. We look at society and we see also the demands of the gospel in the effort to eliminate poverty, eliminate terrorism, all the ways that society is to be brought into line with the common good and the demands of the gospel. We can look by sight and we can hear people say, oh, well, this particular battle cannot be won or society has gone too far in this direction on this other particular battle. But we walk by faith, not by sight. We know that Christ has conquered. And that's why we continue to do what we know we have to do today, both in terms of living faithfully ourselves the law of God and calling society to come into line with it. We thank you, Lord, for the exhortation of St. Paul today, and we ask you to give us that spirit of courage filled also with the joy and peace that come only from you and that no one can take away from us. Let us rejoice in our courage and in our fidelity. Amen.